And good evening. Tonight we begin top story with that breaking news and a tragedy that hits close to home. Two beloved members of a local news station killed in a helicopter crash late today. The fatal crash reported just after noon in Charlotte, North Carolina. Video showing the mangled wreckage of that news helicopter on the side of a major highway. One witness is saying he saw the pilot circling the area to avoid hitting any of the cars. The police chief hailing that action as heroic with no injuries reported on the ground. That pilot identified as Chip Tayag, a veteran flyer with more than 20 years of experience. On board with him, WBTV meteorologist Jason Myers, a loving husband and father of four who grew up in Charlotte. In a statement, their station saying they are now left to grieve a terrible loss. NBC's Blaine Alexander starts us off tonight. Just steps away from the busy I-77 in Charlotte, this is the tragic scene of a news chopper crash. It happened just after noon, killing both people on board. He apparently knew he was in trouble, and he circled looking for a place to put that down. And on the second circle, I don't think he had any choice. It was going down. Inside, two beloved members of the WBTV news team, Sky 3 pilot Chip Tagg, who had been flying for more than 20 years, and meteorologist Jason Meyer. What we're looking at is some of the tornado damage. The father of four grew up in Charlotte and married his childhood friend. In a statement, the station writes in part, the WBTV family is grieving a terrible loss. Now, the community is praising the pilot's action, avoiding the highway, apparently doing all he could to save lives in his final moments. It seems the pilot that was uh, operating the aircraft uh, made some diversionary moves to avoid hitting traffic. If that is truly the case, then uh, that pilot is a hero to, in my eyes. All right, Blaine Alexander joins us now live. Blaine, the, the first question, do we have any idea what caused this crash? Well, Tom, that's exactly exactly what the FAA and the NTSB are investigating tonight. There are just so many questions around this, though. According to the station and by all accounts, this was a very experienced pilot, more than 20 years uh, of flying and more than 2,000 hours with that particular news chopper. So, of course, just a real tragedy, especially this close to the holidays, Tom. You know, Blaine, you, you, you worked in local news and, and viewers build a relationship with those teams in the sky, especially their meteorologists. What more are we hearing about those two beloved members of the local news team? You know, kind of working on the story, I, I got a chance to really learn more about them, especially through their Facebook pages, especially seeing different reports that they had done uh, over the years there in Charlotte. You know, this really is something where uh, the community reached out. You could kind of see it in the statement from the news station, essentially saying they were so grateful for the outpouring of love and prayers and grief and that they really are grieving with the community tonight, Tom. Okay, Blaine Alexander leading us off tonight here on Top Story. Blaine, we appreciate it. For more on this accident, we're joined by former WNBC chopper reporter Kai Simonson, who flew for our NBC New York affiliate WNBC for 20 years. Kai, you and I worked together several times. In 1998, I remember hearing about this story when I was at WNBC. You were in a news helicopter that crashed into a river near Newark while you were covering a power failure. Now, thankfully, you and your pilot, Terry Hawes, were both able to swim to shore safely. But when you see the scenes out of North Carolina, what goes through your mind? Well, it brings it all back, uh, quite frankly. Um, you know, every day that I'm in an aircraft, I think about it. Um, even, you know, so many years later, 24 years later, I still think about it every time I'm, like I said, I'm in that aircraft. Uh, and every time there's an accident, you know, it brings all of those old memories back. It's painful, uh, but it's something I got through. And my heart goes out to the family. You know, these are things that as helicopter reporters, we think about, we know about, we plan for it. Uh, we try to take every possible safety precaution we can, but unfortunately, these things are going to happen. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you about that because there are so many safety protocols for these news teams that are in the sky. There have been accidents in the past. I can remember one in Arizona, one that happened also in Miami. Talk to me about some of the safety precautions uh, pilots and, and reporters like yourself take when you head up into the sky. Well, first of all, there is a training program. You know, we go through a training program to, you know, teach us what to do in an emergency. Uh, they go through exactly how to use our life vests, what to do if, if we do crash, if we crash in the water, uh, how to egress, as they say, how to get out of the aircraft. Uh, if you're lucky enough, you know, to, to still be able to move around. Uh, the pilots are highly trained. Maintenance is very comprehensive. So, you know, when things like this happen, it's easy to think that it happens a lot. But these kind of accidents, especially with news helicopters, 
They really don't happen that often, but it's a risk. It's a managed risk. And it's a risk that we're all aware of as you know, the business that we're in. How, how difficult is it though to maneuver a helicopter once you're, you're either out of control or it looks like there's gonna be a crash landing? Well, it's very hard at the very least. Um, but, you know, if, if there's a mechanical failure of, failure of some kind, then, you know, depending on the failure, of course, but it's very, very difficult to maneuver that, move that aircraft, you know, down to the ground. Um, you know, heart's pumping, you know, your blood, blood uh, is, is racing high, everybody's nervous, uh, but pilots do a very good job of staying calm. That's part of their training. But you know what? If there's a catastrophic failure mechanically, there's very little that you can do. You know, Kai, you sort of build a relationship when you work in local news with the viewers, especially if you are in the helicopter because you're you're providing really important services like talking about the traffic in the morning, the weather, and then also the traffic on the ride home. People depend on you. They feel like they know you and you you feel like almost like a, like like it's part of your day, like like drinking a cup of coffee. What, what, what do you think the community in Charlotte and more importantly, the families of of these two men are, are, are going through right now? Well, I'm sure they're devastated. You know, I know that that's what occurred when I had my crash, the outpouring of feelings from people, people that you don't even know. And of course, you know, your family is, is very upset and devastated that, you know, they know that you went through this experience, fortunately, and turned out okay for me. Again, my heart goes out to the families uh, of those two victims because it didn't turn out that way. I was very lucky. Chopper reporter Kai Simons. And Kai, we, we, we thank you for your time and for your analysis tonight. Now to the latest on that shooting at a nightclub in Colorado Springs. The suspect set to appear virtually in court tomorrow. And tonight we're learning more about one of the heroes credited with saving lives. The Army combat veteran sitting down with our Steve Patterson discussing how he took down the shooter to protect his family and so many others. Having a great time. Then, shortly before midnight, the chaos began. As the crowd scattered from the shooter, Richard ran right for him. Your first instinct as you see him is to rush him, is to take him down. My daughter and my, 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 my whole family was in there. Who's not going to go save them or do what they can to stop somebody from hurting them? Having served 15 years in the Army, Richard says instinct took over. He slammed him to the ground. I hit him everywhere I could find. He had armor on. He may have had a helmet. He may not have had a helmet. I don't know. I know I found a, wet, a little wet, bloody spot, and I just kept going. If Richard had enacted, authorities say the loss of life would have been even more catastrophic. He was a hero way before this in my eyes. There could have been so many more bodies there. There could have been so many more injuries. Um, and there wasn't. Five people died that night, including Richard's daughter's boyfriend, Raymond. She did that scream, that guttural scream, and, and when she found out about Raymond, it was that guttural scream. And it was the worst thing I ever heard. This is my kid. Raymond's mother, Adriana, is heartbroken. He was very kind, and I used to call him my gentle giant. Is it settled in? No, I still, um, I, um, I still think he's going to walk in through the door. Why did that bullet went to him? That's, that's one of my biggest questions. Raymond's family describing the 22-year-old as the life of every room he walked into and the pain of reckoning with his death. I work in a restaurant, and one of the hostess came and says, he says, your husband called, and he said, it's an emergency. I said, oh, my God, what happened? So I called him, and he told me that Raymond was dead. <laughs> Tonight, immense grief and heartbreak that will last a lifetime. Walking past other bodies that were laying there, uh, it's, those, there's, those are things you won't be able to unsee. There's smells you won't be able to unsmell. And it was just horrifying. Steve Patterson joins us now live from Colorado Springs tonight. Steve, a really tough interview, and, and I, I wonder about those two people, right? Richard Fierro, he is, he is so humble, and, and even though he is a hero and he saved a lot of lives, they lost a life, right? Someone so close to them, and it has to be the strangest feeling in the world. Tom, I got to tell you, man, that, that you know, uh, humbleness is not an act. He truly believes he is not a hero and truly believes that anybody in a similar situation would have done a similar thing. Meanwhile, not only did he take the shooter down, but he was leading the triage effort until police arrived, including stabilizing a couple that he knew that was shot. He even had the, the sense of mind to put their hands together because he thought that would be the last time that they would see each other. I could talk for hours about this guy. 
he's truly remarkable. An incredible Tom. act of bravery, no doubt. And Steve, I know you reported on um, the suspect. He's going to appear now virtually in court. Yeah, Tom, that uh, 22-year-old suspect released from the hospital today after, frankly, getting pummeled by those club patrons, taken to the county jail where he will make his first court appearance via video tomorrow. You know, investigators had a hard time tracking his tattered past because of a name change about six years ago. Now, as early as next week, he's facing multiple murder charges, possible hate crime charges, and the possibility that he spends the rest of his life behind bars. Tom. Steve Patterson at a growing memorial there in Colorado Springs. Steve, we thank you for that report. We head overseas now to a powerful earthquake that rocked Indonesia, killing more than 260 people and leaving at least 1,000 injured. Tonight, crews are rushing to find people who may still be trapped underneath all that rubble. NBC's Matt Bradley has more. Tonight, a race against time in Indonesia. Crews rushing to find more than 150 people who are still missing. Following a magnitude 5.6 earthquake that rocked the densely populated island of Java, killing at least 268 people and leaving more than a thousand injured, according to officials. Many of the victims just kids who were in school when the quake hit. Survivors desperately looking for their loved ones. Hussein, please answer, said this man, the man's nephew, trapped under their collapsed home. This is so terrible what I went through with this earthquake. I had to lose relatives and my house was also destroyed. The earthquake triggering deadly landslides, burying entire villages. I'm here because I need to find my family, said this man. When I got here, nothing was left. Everything was buried underground. More than 13,000 people now living in community tents, bracing for possible aftershocks. The country's president visiting the disaster zone earlier. I've already ordered for those victims who are still buried to be recovered and get prioritized an immediate response, he said. Local hospitals also overwhelmed with the wounded as survivors wait to find out the fate of their loved ones. Matt Bradley, NBC News. Back here at home to the tridemic threat ahead of Thanksgiving. Hospitals overwhelmed with cases of RSV, the flu, and COVID-19. Stephanie Gosk has more on what you need to know ahead of the holiday weekend. The strain of three active viruses is being felt in nearly every region of the country. In Kentucky, 30 school districts have had to close at least one school this month because too many students were sick. Seattle Children's Hospital tells NBC News it's been up to 300 percent capacity, driven mostly by RSV. It's a similar story in Minnesota. There have been days when we've had 30 to 40 children uh, waiting in our emergency departments, waiting for an inpatient bed. And in New York. This is a unique situation where we have COVID, RSV and the flu circulating and making making folks sick. COVID has kind of leveled off, but yet so many people are sick. Yeah. And I think you know, we are seeing greater numbers than we have before. Compounding the problem is a shortage of amoxicillin. The popular antibiotic is used to treat bacterial infections, often triggered by respiratory viruses. It's also the go-to medication for infections in children, like strep. Pharmacies in Missouri are closely managing supplies. Lots of drugs have been on shortage and back order. Health officials are urging Americans to get their flu and COVID shots. It's certainly not too late. People go out and get vaccinated this week. They will have a lot of protection during December, January, February onwards, uh, the time that we socialize the most. All yours, Dr. Fauci. Dr. Anthony Fauci appearing in his final White House briefing, capping a 50-year career. Every day for all of those years, I've given it everything that I have, and I've never left anything on the field. One last chance to advise the country as a trio of viruses threaten to upend the holidays. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. We turn now to an intense boat rescue by the Coast Guard off the coast of North Carolina. Take a look at this video. There in the water, you see the boat is almost completely submerged, equipment floating everywhere, some rough seas, and two fishermen struggling to stay above the water. This was the moment the Coast Guard arrived on the scene. Both those men were rescued without any injury, and it's pretty incredible considering all the conditions out there. Two of the Coasties that rescued those men join Top Story Live right now. Petty officers Tyler Robinson and Christopher Theralt. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining Top Story tonight. I want to play that video one more time, and I want you guys to walk us through what happened. Tyler, I'll start with you. What, what did the distress call say when the SOS call came in? 
Yes, sir. So we got a report of a um, fishing vessel taken on water approximately uh, an hour away from us with zero two people on board. And that was the call. And when you got over there, obviously you realized that this boat was about to go under, but it also looked like those two fishermen were about to go under as well. Yes, sir. So we uh, we got on scene. We saw how devastating the situation was. And then you guys can see right there with the one individual without the life jacket properly dawned on him how important it is and how quick things can turn south. And Christopher, um, you know, looking at this at this video, what, what stood out to me was obviously the, the seas were very rough that night, but also all that equipment floating around, parts of the boat there in the water as well. Anything that could maybe, you know, just just take somebody underwater. How do you how do you navigate through those situations? And did you guys come in on a helicopter or were you on another boat? Absolutely. So those are a bunch of dangers that uh, the coxswains and the boat drivers have to look out for as far as. Uh, underneath the boats, the prop spinning, um, gear sinking down into the water, possibly taking people with them. Um, these are all things that crew members uh, like myself have to keep our eyes op open for. And uh, that's what happened there, yep. Talk to me about the rescue, though. So I guess, and I don't know what the exact terminology is, but you guys threw out some type of rope to that first fisherman. Were there concerns about getting to the second one? Yes, sir. So, like, the video showed um, we sent the heaving line over the first one. Uh, we had another heaving line on their boat. And then and the third line was the throw bag. Um, once they went through the rigging, that's when it heightened the, the situation, like, because that's when people start getting snagged in lines and everything. So it's super dangerous in that little part of the boat. Um, and then, yeah, we just sent over lines trying to get a hold of them as we're driving, maneuvering around their boat and all the debris that's in the water. How do you decide? Make... How do you decide whether to jump in the water or not? So I believe when you uh, see people, like, if you can't get to them and they start, like, going unconscious and stuff like that, but they were obviously aware of what was going on. The one guy, um, his life jacket wasn't on properly, so he kind of went underneath the life jacket and then came back up and he was holding it into his arms. So at that point, it's it's just off of situational awareness. Did, did you know what happened to the boat, what, what exactly the situation was with that vessel? We got a call. Um, the vessel was taken on water. We got on scene, talked to the guy. He said he believed it was off his stern, the back of the boat. Um, but we weren't really, really sure exactly where the water was coming in at. And, and Christopher, talk to me about what it looks like out there on the water, because I've been with the Coast Guard in the middle of the night. It is the darkest place on the planet because there, there is no light pollution whatsoever. So you got to make sure you, your guys' spotlights are bright and on them. Absolutely. So the one thing about how we train uh, at every Coast Guard unit is you get a lot of nice training days where it's sunny and beautiful outside, but then nights like that when you see in the video are definitely not ideal for the kind of conditions you want to be out in. So it just goes to show training, 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 how hard we train and um, just to be ready for nights like this. What did the two fishermen tell you afterwards? After we pulled them off the boat, they were devastated. Um, they mentioned that they bought that boat the same day, which is, uh, that's some tough news to talk to them about. Um, they did not know where the water was coming in from. We were there to try to dewater their boat with the pump. And unfortunately it just was taken on water too quick. So that was some tough news for those two mariners. Um, I think the video shows how quickly things can go down, um, and how important it is to train for our side in the Coast Guard and how important it is for the public, mariners, commercial fishing vessels to get properly examined by either the auxiliarist or another attachment um, and have the right PPE, the equipment on board, just in case you do end up in this situation. Coming up next, the bird strike scare in Chicago, all caught on camera, a military plane flying right into a flock of birds, you see it here, then forced to turn around the high ranking officer who was on board at the time, that's next. All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with that update on the deadly ramming at an Apple store in Massachusetts. The driver, 53-year-old Bradley Rain, charged with reckless homicide by motor vehicle in a Plymouth County court today, 
Rain telling the judge his foot got stuck on the gas pedal and he was unable to brake. One person killed and 19 others injured in that crash. Rain's bail has been set at $100,000 and he's due back in court next month. A dramatic moment caught on camera in the skies over Chicago. Look closely, a military plane flying right through a flock of birds just moments after takeoff. That plane forced to turn around immediately and make an emergency landing at Midway Airport. The highest ranking officer in the National Guard on board at the time, no injuries were reported. In California, a trip to an amusement park taking a scary turn for a group of teenagers. Four riders trapped more than 60 feet in the air after a roller coaster at the Scandia Fun Center in Sacramento stopped moving. Firefighters using a massive ladder to help them get back to the ground. The group was at the park to celebrate a 14th birthday. No word yet on what caused that ride to break down. President Biden extending the pause on student loan repayments once again. Borrowers with federal loans will not be required to make payments until July at the earliest. The pause was slated to end in January. But the White House now delaying that deadline with the plan tied up in the courts. This marks the eighth time since the start of the pandemic that loan payments have been deferred. And comedian Sinbad is learning to walk again two years after suffering a stroke. Images posted to his new website showing the long road to recovery. The actor who spent more than nine months in the hospital saying in a statement, I will not stop fighting until I can walk across the stage again. His family saying their medical bills have far surpassed what their insurance will cover. And they're now asking for the public support. Okay, now to an update on that scary crash in Los Angeles where a car struck a group of sheriff's department recruits who were out on a training run, injuring 25 of them. The man behind the wheel now speaking out exclusively to our affiliate station, KNBC-TV, telling anchor Colleen Williams that that incident was not intentional. The sheriff says you did this intentionally. Is that true? No, that's false. Nicholas Gutierrez says he doesn't remember exactly what led up to the crash, but he knows it was not deliberate. Is there anything you'd like to add? No, just apologies to what happened. It wasn't intentional. Nicholas was going to work as an electrician, installing solar panels on what started as a routine day. Law enforcement sources told the NBC4i team a witness saw Nicholas looking down, possibly at a mapping device or possibly dozing off. I take the same route every day. So you were familiar with the area? Yes. The crash happened early Wednesday morning in the South Whittier area near Mills Avenue and Trumbull Street. The class of about 75 recruits was on a training run when they were hit. Some of the uh, recruits said that you didn't break. What do you remember? Anything at all about this? I fell asleep at the wheel and I woke up to people banging on the window to get out. I had no words. When I got out, asked if they were okay and they pulled me on and took me to the ground. 25 cadets were injured and rushed to multiple trauma hospitals. Initially, five were listed as critical. One of them now listed in grave condition. In the moments after the crash, Nicholas was detained and given a field sobriety test. He is represented by attorney Alexandra Kazarian. Not only did he pass the sobriety test, but CHP took him to the hospital and did a toxicology report and it came back clean. There was no alcohol, no drugs in his system. We're following breaking news nearly. The Gutierrez family learned about the crash on the news. Well, I was devastated. It was, it was horrible to hear that those people got run over. But I didn't know it was my son at the time. Nicholas's mother tracked the 22-year-old's SUV using an app after a family member recognized his car during breaking news reports. What happened to your face? This was when? I, I don't think that we're going to talk You're about that. It. No. Was it the airbag? No. It, went off. it wasn't the accident? No. Nicholas did not want to discuss his injuries, nor did his attorney. Sheriff's deputies booked him on suspicion of attempted murder of a peace officer. While in custody, he took a lie detector test. The results, according to him, what were they? It came out negative. Deputies with a warrant later that day searched the family home for evidence. On Thursday evening, more than 24 hours after the crash, sheriff's deputies released a press release saying Nicholas remained in jail on a $2 million bail. Hours later, bail suddenly removed. No charges filed, and Nicholas was released. One of the homicide detectives, he's the one that called me yesterday and said, you know, after speaking with his co-workers and your neighbors uh, in some investigation, he says, we just don't see your son actually doing this intentionally and my partner is filing the paperwork to have him released. Uh, I think it's a very rare circumstance that in that 
short amount of time, they did so much work and also came to the conclusion that the charges that they arrested him for were, were not going to hold up as far as probable cause was concerned. Nicholas Gutierrez is a triplet, very close to his two sisters and his parents. They want people to know he has never been in trouble. He's never heard it hurt anyone in his he's never gotten into a fight surrounded by his family nicholas talked about respect for the law and how something like this crash would be so foreign to his way of life and upbringing his family represents a long line of law enforcement he doesn't have anything against officers we have a whole family that's uh, that are officers two brothers that are retired uh, california Highway patrol i've got uh, two cousins that are l.a county sheriffs one retired one still active and I've got another cousin who is a LAPD retired detective and myself at the Department of Corrections. Nicholas, how often do you think about that day and sort of replay it in your mind? Since the second happened, it's just, I've been living it like I woke up in a nightmare. What would you want to say to the families or those recruits that you saw out there that day? I didn't intentionally do it. I, I wish it never happened. I feel essentially like, I feel bad it happened. Now to Top Stories Global Watch and the investigation to one of the deadliest fires in China in recent years. At least 38 people killed in that massive blaze at a factory in central China. The two-story building almost entirely engulfed in flames. Chinese authorities say the fire was caused by an electrical issue and that several people have been taken into custody. And in eastern Russia, two volcanoes showing signs of major eruptions. One of Europe's most active volcanoes became extremely active in recent days even triggering an earthquake on Saturday. Scientists warning it could be the region's most significant eruption in more than a decade. Both volcanoes are located in remote areas, but officials say eruptions could disrupt some international flights. And soccer superstar Cristiano Ronaldo is leaving premier club Manchester United immediately. The club and Ronaldo making the announcement today saying it was a mutual agreement. The decision comes after the star forward gave an explosive interview criticizing the club's manager and owners. It's unclear where he will go afterwards, but right now he is playing for his home country of Portugal in the World Cup. And speaking of the World Cup, a major upset alert in the first round. Saudi Arabia shocking the world with a stunning 2-1 to one win over heavily favored Argentina and soccer superstar Lionel Messi. Our Megan Fitzgerald is there on the ground in Doha, Qatar, with the latest. Megan, I got to think this was massive news over there, a huge win for Saudi Arabia. The country announcing tomorrow will actually be a national holiday because of this victory. Walk us through how it all yeah. unfolded. Yeah, Tom, you know, this is such an upset that not only did it shock Argentina, but it also shocked Saudi Arabia. Uh, so much so that, like you mentioned, tomorrow is a holiday for the entire nation. But what we saw in this game earlier today, Argentina coming out strong as expected. We saw Lionel Messi scoring uh, within the first 10 minutes of the game. They were able to hold on to that lead all the way into the second half. That's when we saw Saudi Arabia score those back-to-back -back points within about five minutes of each other. They were able to hold on to that lead all the way to the end to finish this upset with a two to one victory over Argentina Tom. So this is believed to be Messi's last World Cup. How, how, what kind of pressure does this now put on Argentina now that they're down one game. Yeah, that's right. Tremendous amount of pressure here. Lionel Messi, arguably the best football player in the entire world who doesn't have a World Cup title. He wants it. He's talked about it. The team knows the pressure that's there. And look, all is not lost here. It is possible that Argentina could win it all. Certainly doesn't look good in this moment. Uh, right now, they've got a lot of work to do to try and advance to the knockout round. They've got Mexico coming up on Saturday, and then, of course, they'll play Poland. They either have to win both of those games or, at a minimum, they have to win and draw. Tom. And so, Megan, I also know you got a chance to speak with some of the fans there over the last couple of days. What's the World Cup experience been like? Yeah, these fans are pumped up. They're excited. They realize that this is a roller coaster. I mean, we've seen uh, this collision of sports, uh, politics, social justice, human rights colliding all in one. But every fan that we've talked to, no matter where they're from in the world, everyone believes that they're going to be able to cheer their, their team to victory. And, you know, what we saw today, anything can happen. This is an upset with Saudi Arabia that we never expected. Uh, so we'll just see what happens here. Yeah, and finally, um, lastly, two of the day's biggest competitions drawing even both Mexico versus Poland and Denmark versus Tunisia finishing with nil. Yeah. Nil draws. Is the competition closer than expected early on here? 
you know what, Tom? So much of this tournament here, just within the last couple of days, unexpected. I mean, we've seen that on, we've seen that off the field. There are some clear favorites here uh, right now. France, Brazil, England, those are some of the top three teams that are favored to win this. But it's anybody's guess at this point. And that's part of what makes this tournament so fun to watch because it really is unexpected. We're seeing these underdogs really doing some big things here, coming out of nowhere with these wins. So again, all eyes are going to be on this tournament moving forward. All right, Megan Fitzgerald, sounds like you're at the airport. A lot going on over there in Qatar, apparently. Thanks so much. Coming up, yeah. the holiday travel rush. More than 50 million people expected to travel over this holiday weekend. And airlines say they are prepared, but we have tips for passengers if your flight is delayed or canceled. That's next. Stay with us. We are back now with the holiday travel rush. Millions of Americans on the move this week for Thanksgiving. After a chaotic summer, airlines are promising smooth skies for one of the busiest weekends of the year. But it only takes one bad storm to slow things down. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello is tracking it all for us. This night before the week's busiest travel day, airports and roads are filling up. John Hartzell spending about $200 on gas over a two-day, 900-mile drive with his dog, Millie, from Atlanta to Milwaukee for Thanksgiving with his parents. Where I was born, be sleeping in my childhood bed, so it's always nice to go back to. The National Safety Council warns this could be the deadliest Thanksgiving since 2007, with a potential for nearly 520 people to die in traffic accidents, distracted and impaired driving the major factors. <laughs> Outside of Denver, South Metro Fire Rescue Station 44 covers a busy stretch of I-25 where rollovers are common. And those that are not seatbelted a lot of times aren't even in the vehicle when we show up on scene because they've been ejected out of a window or the windshield. Traffic safety pros with a reminder, buckle up, drive sober, and put away the phone. Meanwhile, blue skies are helping the airlines avoid a repeat of the summer travel trouble. Still looking at a clean OIS? Going straight to the terminal timeline. At the FAA Command Center, they track every plane flying in U.S. airspace. Thanksgiving really isn't the busiest air travel time of the year. The busiest day this year was back in May, 51,000 flights. The challenge of Thanksgiving is opening up military airspace because the flights are full and they want people to get to their destinations and back home again. That military airspace now open off the East Coast. That makes more airspace available for more airplanes to fly. The pace only picks up tomorrow. Tom Costello, NBC News, Washington. All right, we thank Tom Costello for that report. AAA estimating, get this, 55 million Americans will be taking planes, trains, and automobiles to get to a turkey this year. So are the airlines, though, really ready for this holiday rush? Here to help us answer that question, Scott Keyes. He's the founder and chief flight expert at Scott's Cheap Flights. So, Scott, you know, we saw chaos this summer. Then it started to get a little smoother by the end of summer into fall. What are you expecting for this Thanksgiving travel season? Yeah, look, first thing I'm expecting is the Thanksgiving travel crowds to look basically like they did pre-pandemic. You know, after the past two holiday travel periods that were pretty understandably subdued, uh, the travel numbers this Thanksgiving are looking at basically like they were in 2019. That's going to mean busy airports, long lines, and full planes. In fact, planes more full today than they were pre-pandemic. That's certainly going to be a big test for the airlines. Are we going to see a repeat like we did early in the summer? I'm cautiously optimistic that things are going to go a lot smoother than they did at the beginning of the summer. You've seen already so far this week uh, the number of flight cancellations staying below 100 each day, double digits. That's well below the normal average of closer to 200. And so I'm hopeful this means that we're not going to see the kind of widespread disruptions that many folks had feared. You know, Scott, Thanksgiving is often a tight travel window. Some people cut it really close for a lot of reasons. They have to work on Wednesday. Maybe they want to save a little extra money and fly on Thursday. And some people, they really want to get to that Thanksgiving dinner table, right? They're, they're thinking about grandma stuffing. It can be stressful. What rights do passengers have if they get on the plane or they get to the airport and they start seeing their flight is delayed? 
Yeah, you know, there are a few things that they that, that they have in the way of rights. First of all, is that when you book a flight, you are uh, uh, the airline is obligated to get you to your final destination, even if the original ticket that you had booked, even if that flight gets canceled. So if that flight gets canceled or you miss a connection, it's not as though you're left on your own. They're still responsible for reaccommodating you and getting you on the next available flight. Uh, you one of the big rights that folks aren't necessarily aware of is that when an airline cancels or significant delays your flight, you are entitled to a full cash refund if you would like one. But that's going to be either taking that refund or taking the flight. For many folks, they might say, well, the new flight that they're offering isn't actually even going to get me there until Friday. So I'll take the refund and then try to either book a flight on another airline, maybe look about a road trip. Those are some of the rights that passengers have. But if you're putting off travel until Thursday, your options might be pretty limited to get there in time for, for Grand stuffing. Yeah, I know you're living life on the edge, but some people like to live that way. Scott, before you go and briefly, if you can, because you're such an expert in these things, um, I do want to ask you about Christmas. Is it too late to book? Because we booked our, our, our Christmas travel uh, about a month ago, and I thought it was really expensive even back then. It's getting too late. Look, they, they, the thing is that while the best time to have booked your Christmas flights would have been July 4th, when there really were fares like $252 round trip to the Bahamas, uh, what you want to remember is that while last minute flights tend to be expensive, not all last minute flights are equally expensive. If you put it off until December 24th, booking your flight, that fare is going to be a lot more expensive than it is today. So what you want to do is circle the date 21 days before the day you plan to travel and try to get your flight booked by that at the very latest. So if, for instance, if you hope to travel on December 22nd, circle December 1st as the sort of drop dead date to get your flights booked, because the way many airfare work is that you have to uh, uh, abide by their advance purchase requirement, which often says this fare is only available if you book it at least 21 days before travel. On day 20, that previously cheapest fare expires. It's no longer available. And the new cheapest fare is going to be $100 or $200 more expensive. So if you've been putting it off, time to finally book. Don't put it off any longer. All right, Scott Keys from Scott's Cheap Flight. Scott, we appreciate it. Another thing getting underway this week, the holiday shopping season. Retailers already advertising Black Friday and Cyber Monday deals, but is it really helping you save? NBC's Maggie Vespa looked into it for us. With America's banner day of holiday deals on deck and promises of staggering savings on display, tonight shoppers are already looking beyond the Thanksgiving feast to Black Friday. Looks like there are going to be some good sales and we're excited about that. And in some cases, beyond. I usually find the sales just keep going on through the rest of the season. Indeed, amid sky-high inflation, discounts have been mounting for months. So, with the infamous Christmas creep not just applying to early decorations, but deals, too, it begs a question. Are Black Friday, and even Cyber Monday for that matter, as big of a deal this year? Well, they still are a really big deal. In fact, the National Retail Federation estimating more than 166 million Americans plan to shop between Thanksgiving and Cyber Monday, the group's highest estimate ever, up nearly 8 million from last year. Given inflation's fluctuating effect on prices, experts recommend shoppers do their research. It's harder to know if you are getting a good deal, but the deals are still out there. For electronics, the lowest prices are on Black Friday. With clothing, especially winter clothing, those prices will drop in January. So you really ideally want to wait if you can. And if you have your eye on something specific, like this year's hottest toy, consider buying early in case stores run out. Setting up Santa for a successful holiday. Another tip from the experts, they say a lot of retailers are going to be price matching throughout the holidays. So if you buy something on Black Friday and the price drops later, there's a good chance you can bring it back to the retailer to get that partial refund and make up the difference. Tom. We thank you so much for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.